welcome to chapter six, uh, where we will be talking about exponential equations and functions. And in order to do that, in section 6.1, we're going to be talking about um, properties of square roots. So square roots should not be too terribly difficult for you to comprehend right off the bat because you've probably seen some of these things before. But just to kind of give you a a overly simplistic definition of what a square root is. It's what number when multiplied by itself one time is equal to the number under the radical sign. I know that sounds really complicated, but in all truth and honesty, that's really the best way I know how to say it. It's easier to show you a number. So for instance, these are some common square roots. Most of these you probably already know. For instance, the square root of 1 is 1. And the reason why that is, is if I take 1 and multiply it by itself, I get 1. So the number 1 is, when multiplied by itself, gives me 1. Same thing here. Square root of 4 is 2 because when 2, when multiplied it by itself, is 4. Square root of 9 is 3. The square root of 16 is 4. Square root of 25 is 5. And so forth, so on. You can read this, and I'm not going to. And again, most of these you already know um, more than likely because of your multiplication table. You know that 8 times 8 is 64. So the square root of 64 it happens to be the number 8. All right, so these are the most common that you'll see uh, probably currently. Now, I will show you these right here. These will also show up. Square root of 169 is 13. The square root of 196 is 14. And the square root of 225 is 15. This is one of those things that I'll go ahead and tell you. Even though you could figure this out in your mind on your own, more than likely the best thing for you to do is actually have this memorized. There's no shortcut in this because especially later on when you get into a pre-calculus type class, this is going to show up a lot. And if you don't have this in your mind about how um, perfect squares and square roots work, then you're going to get lost pretty quick. So my suggestion is to memorize this and try to have it in your mind at all times. Now, with that being said, Let's get on to the big meat of this uh, section, and it's called a property, uh, product property of square roots. And I'm giving you two different examples. I'm giving you something that we do algebraically, where the square root of x times y, we can rewrite this as the square root of x times the square root of y. We just basically are breaking up this uh, information, these uh, pieces under the radical sign into two different places. And this is a very useful skill, especially when we go to simplify radicals later on, such as this. I have uh, the square root of 9 times 5. I'm able to break it out and say the square root of 9 times the square root of 5 is equal to, and look at what happens here. It's equal to 3 times the square root of 5. Here's the reason. The square root of 9 is equal to 3 because we can prove that up here. And since I'm saying 3 times square root of 5, it's 3 times the square root of 5. Now you're probably thinking this looks like kind of like the distributive property. In some ways it kind of is, but just know this, you're not going to go 3 times 5 inside of that radical sign. That's not the way this works. Quotient property of square roots is pretty much, very much, uh, pretty much identical. If I am square rooting x divided by y, I can simplify it and just say the square root of x divided by the square root of y. Now, here is something that's very interesting. It may not, it's not all that important to you right at the moment, but it is very, very, very important when you start getting into pre-calculus. It says where x is greater than or equal to zero and y is greater than the zero. In other words, this expression. This expression only works if x is greater than or equal to zero and y is greater than or equal to zero. Or excuse me, just greater than zero. Here is the reason. If x happened to be a negative number, this, if I tried to plug it into my calculator, let's just put square root of negative 1 into my calculator, it says I have an error. In other words, I cannot square root a negative number. That is why x must be greater than or equal to 0. But since it says greater than, can I do that? Well, if I square root a 0, what happens? Clear that out, square root of 0, I actually get 0. 
So I could possibly get a zero if x is zero. So that's okay. But look at this. Y has to be greater than zero. We can't make it equal to zero. Why is that the case? Let's pretend again that we found, we found x and then y happens to be zero. Well, what happens? Well, the square root of y is also zero. And let's say x was, uh, we solved for x and it ended up being two. Well, now we have a fraction that says two divided by zero. Well, the problem with that is we can't do that. This is undefined. So this rule has to be in place where x has to be greater than or equal to zero and y must be greater than zero. Otherwise, we get an undefined fraction. And again, I don't expect you to know that right now. I really don't, but I wanted to mention it to you because it is a very, it's something that you're going to see a lot when you get into more of a pre-calculus class. Speaking of pre-calculus and getting into what we call trigonometry, here are our numbers. I have the square root of three divided by the square root of four. I'm able to simplify it and say the square root of three divided by the square root of four, and then I can simplify that again to the square root of three over two. This number, this rational number, or excuse me, irrational number, right here, this number is something you are going to become very familiar with when you get into trigonometry. Um, I'm not going to explain it right now, but this is going to be uh, basically something you have to memorize. So this number is very relevant uh, later on in trigonometry. Now, let's move on just a little bit. So we have some expressions here. I have the uh, square root 44, and I can use my calculator here, and I'm gonna show you what happens. The square root, in case you don't know where the square root button is on this calculator, is second, and then this x square button right here you see on the bottom of your screen gives us the square root. I don't put that in my calculator, and I get some weird looking number that makes no sense. Now, if you can recall, when you get these types of numbers, this is something that we call an irrational number, all right? So that might be something you may remember. Uh, if not, it's okay, but this is what we call an irrational number. And here's the problem. With it being an irrational number in that, in that calculator, it's kind of hard to manipulate with this and to work with it. So I have to simplify this expression to something that's easier. Now, you're also th probably thinking, well, why don't I use this calculator? Well, let's find out. Let's go second, and it's the same button. That x squared gives me the square root, and I'll put 44 in there. And it gives me just a, the identical number. It's craziness. So what do we do? Well, we have to ask ourselves this. Can I break this 44 up into its factors? Remember, factors happen to be numbers that multiplied. So if I had the number six, the factors of six may be three times two, or I can do one times six. These are factors, all right? So we're gonna do something very similar to here, but this time, I'm going to see if I can break it up into factors, and at least one of them has to be a perfect square or a square root. So if I were to look at my sheet, that I have, I want to divide 44 by one of these numbers that happens to be a common square root. And the first one that you see is four. So I can break this up into four, and I know that 44 divided by four is 11. So what I have done is I have factored this out into two components. I have factored it out into a perfect square, the perfect square number four, and I've factored it out to 11. So I have redone this. And this brings us to that property of square roots. And I can rewrite this to say the square root of four times the square root of 11 and then knowing the square root of four happens to be two times the square root of 11, I can simply combine it and say that this is equal to two times the square root of 11. If I were to put the original problem back in, the square root of 44, I get that weird number again. And now I'm gonna put in my simplified expression, two times the square root of 11. I get literally the same number. So these two numbers are equal. I just factored out the perfect square. That's what we're doing. All right, so now we're gonna look at this one. 
All right, so first off, notice that there's a negative on the outside. So when I go to break this apart, when I go to factor it out, I've got to keep that negative there, and I'll keep my radical sign. Now I need to find a perfect square that can go into 175. Well, I can look at my list, and the one that I want to try right now happens to be 25. So I'm going to test that out. I'm going to say 175 divided by 25, and it does divide evenly. So I can say that this, when factored, is the square root of 25 times 7. All right, now that I've done that, I can break it apart even farther. A negative square root of 25 times the square root of 7, and I can break this out even farther. The square root of 25 happens to be 5, so I can say negative 5, because those are basically, there's like an invisible one, and they're multiplying, times the square root of 7. And ultimately, when I do that, I get negative 5 times the square root of 7, and I'm done. And I can prove this to be true again by going negative square root of 175, I get this weird looking number, and now I'm gonna go negative five times the square root of seven. And when I do, I get the same weird number. All right, let's try number three. All right, remember that negative is on the outside, and I can rewrite this as the square root of 10 over the square root of 49. And we're going to see if anything's here. So the square root of 10, do I have a perfect uh, square root that works that I can divide evenly? into 10. No, I don't. But I do have something I can use here for 49. And I do know that the square root of 49 happens to be 7. So I could say the square root of 10 over 7. And this is literally as far as I can take that problem. There's nothing more for me to do. That negative stays on the outside. It's the square root of 10 divided by 7. I'm done. Well, let's look at this next one. I have the square root of 54 divided by 81. I can break that out to say the square root of 54 divided by the square root of 81. So my first thing that I notice right off the bat is that this guy right here can become a nine because the square root of 81 is nine. So my denominator is now nine. But I have to ask myself, is there a square root that I can use in 54? So I can go and look into my stuff here, and I might know a few things. Well, first off, hey, fit, um, let's try 4. Does 54, can 54 be divided by 4 evenly? No, nope, it cannot. Let's try, I don't think 9, I know 9 won't work. Let's try 16 just out of curiosity. 54 divided by 16, will that work? Nope, it will not. Uh, let's see, is there anything else that may work? I know 36 won't, 49 won't, and 64 won't. So I literally had to go through all of these and see if there was one that would work. And there is not. Uh, wait a minute, hang on, I've told you wrong. I may have missed one. This is what happens, this is why you do it. 54 divided by nine, I said wouldn't work, but does it? Yes, it does, it does work. So I can actually rewrite this as saying it's the square root of nine times six. All right, so look how easy it is to mess up on this. You got to take it real slow. You have to know your square roots and you have to be able to factor them out. All right, so when I do, I can rewrite this one more time to say the square root of nine times the square root of six, all divided by the number nine. Well, let's finish this out. This is a square root. I can rewrite it as three times the square root of six divided by nine. And this is probably where you're thinking, hey, Mr. Lewis, this looks like it's done. I can't do anything else. And you're wrong. Here is something I need you to see. I have a three and I have a nine, and then there's a square root. But what you need to realize something is that three and the nine they have something in common. They're both the whole numbers. They're both integers. Where this right here is under a radical sign, these two aren't. And we can actually treat this like a fraction. This is 3 ninths. And if you can recall, 3 ninths, when reduced, gives me 1 third. So I can rewrite this one more time. I'm going to draw an arrow to where we're going. I can rewrite this one more time to saying 1 times 6 over 3. 
Ultimately, one times that will just simply be the square root of six over three. And that's it, all right? That was a difficult one because as you saw, I had to kind of look through my stuff. I had to find out that the square root of 54 can be broken up into nine times six, which we find out can be broken down to the square root of nine times the square root of six, which can be broken into three times the square root of six. I also had to realize that the square root of 81 could be written as nine, and in doing so, it creates a fraction, three ninths, which we can reduce to one third, and ultimately, we would have the square root of six over three. All right? Now, five gets even more complicated. So, we've got to do the same thing. We've got to simplify. And first off, you might be thinking, hey, this reminds me of the distributive property, and you're right, and you might want to go eight divided by four and then do 112 divided by four, but that's where you would be wrong. The first thing we have to do is simplify this radical. So, we need to find and see if there's anything I can divide 112 by evenly according to my chart over here. So, I'm just going to hit some things. 112, let's try nine because I messed up last time. That won't work. 112 divided by four, four will work. All right. Well, I'm very curious to see if I can find a bigger one. We know four will work, so I'll just put a little mark there. Nine won't work. Let's try 16. 112 divided by 16. Hey, that's a bigger number. Check it out. Because I tried 16, notice that I got this, a seven. So a while ago, I tried four and I had a really large number left over. This time I tried 16 and I had a smaller number. And I know that seven is a prime number. Because I know seven is a prime and I know that this is my perfect square, I don't have to try out any more numbers. So I can rewrite this as eight minus the square root of 16 times seven all over four. Eight minus the square root of 16 times seven all over four. Now that I can do that, I can break things out. Eight minus the square root of 16 times the square root of seven all over four. I know that the square root of 16 happens to be four, so I'm gonna kind of draw my line to the next step. Eight minus four times the square root of seven all over four. Now that I've simplified that expression, that one term, I can now use the distributive property and say eight divided by four is two, and then four divided by four is one, or negative one in this case, and I can say one times the square root of seven, all right? Or rewrite it and just get rid of the one. One uh, would be two minus the square root of seven, all right? So again, a longer problem, but we had to look at our list, all right? Now let's do six together, same concept. I need to see if there's anything right off the bat. And just because I've done this long enough, I want to try 36. I know 36 is a perfect square. Let's see what happens. 72 divided by 36, it is. And that leaves me with the prime number of two. So really, I have factored that out completely. So I can say six plus the square root of 36 times two. I have that perfect square times that number, and we know it's 72, all over 18. So this would give me negative six plus the, uh, the square root of 36 times the square root of two, all over 18. I'm gonna kind of draw me an arrow to show my work process. I have negative six plus six, because the square root of 36 is six, the square root of two, over 18. Now, same situation here, can I use distributive property. Yes, I can. I have a six divided by 18. Now you're probably thinking, Mr. Lewis, if I go six divided by 18, I'm gonna get some weird stuff. And you're exactly right, I get some gobbledygook. But this is some gobbledygook that you should know right off the top of your head, because I told you to memorize it. When you see point three 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 repeating, you should automatically think one third. And since I have two sixes here, that means that negative six divided by that will give me a negative one plus one times square root of two 
over 3. Why did I just do that? Because I literally divided each thing. Six, negative 6 by 18 gives me a negative 1 third. And 6 divided by 18 is a 1 third. So I can rewrite it one last time to make negative 1 plus the square root of 2 over 3. All right? Whew! That's a lot, and we're still not done. This is going to be one of those long videos, and I just want to work every problem out with you. So now we have, it says simplify the expression. This one is not nearly as bad uh, as the ones above, but we're still going to do it. We can break this out to say the square root of 36 times the square root of x times the square root of y squared. Well, this is easy. We know that that's going to become 6. This one and this one are a little bit difficult. So, right here, the square root of x, is there a number or a variable that I can multiply by itself that equals x? Not really. I could do x times 1, and that would equal x, but that's it. So, because of that, I can't do anything with it. I leave it alone. But what about this one? It's the square root of y squared. What number or variable, when I multiply it by itself, gives me y squared? Well, that one's easy. It's y. y times y equals y squared. Remember your rules with exponents. If I have y to the first times y to the first, it becomes y to the second. All right? So basically what just happened here, I was able to simplify that. Now I have this. But I'm going to still multiply everything else. And the way we do this is we like to take everything that's not under a radical sign and we put it together. So that would become 6y times the square root of x. Let's try this next one. I'm going to break it out. Square root of 50 times the square root of x squared times the square root of y times the square root of z to the third power. Now, we're going to do things just like we've been doing. We're going to look at that 50 and ask ourselves, can we break that out even farther? And we can. We can say that this is the square root of 25 times the square root of 2 because we factored it out. And now we can continue with our thought process. Actually, let's just go ahead and simplify this. We know that x squared, when square rooted, becomes x all right, because x times x is x squared. We know we can't do anything with this guy, so we're going to leave it alone because there's nothing we can do. Now look at this one. This one's difficult. So I can, I break this out any farther. Yes, I can. I can actually say that this is z squared times z. Why that? Well, recall this. I know that z squared is a perfect square, and I know that I can square root it. So, and I also know, based upon my rules of exponents, that z squared times z to the first power, which is what this is, is equal to z to the third. So I've simplified it. Now that I've broke it out farther, I can kind of continue to go, and I'm going to just rewrite this for the sake of time. So the square root of 25 is 5 times the square root of 2, times x, times the square root of y, times the square root of 2 uh, square is going to give me just z, times the square root of z. Phew! Now we can start combining our like terms. Remember what I said, everything that's not under a radical sign we like to put together. So this 5, that x, and that z we can put together. 5, x, z. And the numbers that are on the right, under the radical sign, we can put those together. So I can say times the square root of 2yz. All right. This is definitely a difficult one. And as you see these, please come talk to me and I will walk you step by step on these. All right. And please watch this video over and over again. So just a big takeaway on this. You have to remember 
that when you have a z to a square or a variable to a square, we can treat that like a perfect square. All right, I'm gonna leave nine to you to let you think about that one for a little while, but I do have a couple of more problems I want to talk about, and I'm already at 25 minutes and two seconds exactly according to my time here. So I'm running long, but it's okay. It says evaluate square root. So we're gonna evaluate them again, but this time I've given you an, a little expression. And this expression is also something that you are going to see probably maybe a chapter or two from now. And basically, we're just going to plug these numbers in. I'm going to say the square root of b squared, in this case it's negative 8 squared minus 4 times a, which is 2, times c, which is 4. I'm going to plug everything in. So let's simplify this. I know that this is going to be negative 8 squared. Well, negative 8 times negative 8 is going to give me a positive 64. I'm going to work everything inside this expression first. And then I know that 4 times 2 is 8 times 4 again is going to give me 32, I think. Did I do that right? 4 times 2 times 4 gives me, yep, 32. So that would be minus 32. So now I've got to simplify this. So I'm still working everything out under the radical sign. So when I simplify it, I get the square root of 32. Now, I want to continue to work with this. And I need to ask myself, is there any perfect squares that can go into 32? Well, 32 divided by 4, that works. Uh, let's see, is there anything else? 32 divided by 16. Yep, that works. 16 would be my biggest perfect square because it gives me a smaller prime number left over. So I can rewrite that as the square root of 16 times 2, which can be rewritten one more time as the square root of 16 times the square root of 2. The square root of 16 is 4 times the square root of 2. All right. A lot of little steps are involved, and we were following PEMDAS. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. First off, we had to work everything under the radical sign. We did our exponents, then we did our multiplication, then we did our subtraction, and then because we were done on the inside of our, of our radical, we were able to simplify it into its factors. And then once we were able to do that, we were able to use the power um, product property of square roots, and then we were able to simplify it one last time. All right, so a lot of moving parts, again, needs plenty of practice. All right, evaluate the expression when x is negative 2, y is 8, and z is 1 half. So let's plug everything in. 2 times negative 2 squared plus uh, 8 squared. Hey, we didn't happen to use the z in this one, so that's fine. So let's follow PEMDAS. We're going to go inside of our radical this time, and we're going to work it out and use our exponents. This would give me 2 times 4, because the square root of two, uh, negative 2 squared is 4, because negative 2 times negative 2 is 4. And then I'm going to add 8 squared is going to give me 64. Continue to work this out. I have 8 plus 64. And then continue, I have, I believe this is going to give me 72. Let's verify, 8 plus 64 is 72. All right, now we need to verify and see if there's any common um, square roots I can pull out. Let's see if it is. I think 36 will probably do it. So 72 divided by 36 will give me 2. So I can break this out and say that it's the square root of 36 times 2. Or we can rewrite it as 30 square root of 36 times the square root of 2. And ultimately, this would give me 6 times the square root of 2. Or we can just write it like that. So all that work led to this. All right, so this has probably been the longest video that I've ever done for you guys. But I will tell you this, this is not an easy thing to do. This is literally everything that you have done before and it's being hijacked and smushed together. Welcome to real algebra. 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 Welcome to real algebra.